my name is Annalise. I work for Avangard Renewables, and today I'm going to talk to you about the work I've done with them to uh, automate the solar resource and production assessment. Uh, based on a lot of the you know, presentations that have gone on earlier today, some of this is definitely going to be like basic for some of you who are you know, more experienced coding, but I think it's a good outline for some of the people who are still trying to figure out how to get kind of into that process and implement those coding tools within their methodologies. So roadmap here, what am I doing today? I'm trying to cut out a lot of the busy work in what I do so that I have the time to pull more information earlier into our design process. And I wanna do that so I can make more informed decisions. I'm doing all of this work using Python and Python accessible software packages. If you are looking to automate some of your processes, you don't necessarily have to use Python. It's not better than other languages, but with the accessibility of PVLib, which is amazing, um, and with the use of Python, you know, all the people you've heard talking about it so far today, I would highly recommend you consider it. It's just really well used, a lot of support within the solar community. Um, so when we get to the end of this, I'm going to talk about some other applications, because when you have these automated processes in place, it's really easy to extend them into other valuable tools like a resource set or pipeline assessment or resource and methodology updates. A bit of background, a lot of you probably already know this. An API is an application programming interface. An SDK is a software development kit. Uh, PVLib is actually just a Python package. Uh, you don't really need to know what these acronyms stand for. What you need to know is that it, it's a way to interact with pre-existing tool using a programming language. So for example, Sam has an SDK that allows you to run their solar modeling through Python. Solar Farmer has an API that allows you to run their software programmatically. This can be pretty helpful. Why do you care? Because button pushing is a waste of everyone's time. Uh, if you're the meteorologist, it's a waste of your time. You'd rather be focusing on more interesting aspects of your job, but it also holds back the people who work downstream of you, whether that's your development team, your engineering team, CapEx, your investment office, all those people who are using your outputs as their inputs. So how do we cut down on that button pushing? We start by looking at our process. I want to run a solar assessment right now. I need to open a, a program or web browser. I have to navigate to my project area or my website. Then I have to fill out a bunch of project specific information. From then I hit submit and there might be a pretty substantial wait time here if I have a complex project. Finally, I'm ready to download my data. There's another wait time. And all of this is just to get to the point of being able to format and analyze your output. If we automate this process, we can take it down to three steps. We open that programming language. We fill out that project specific information. There's no way around that part. But from there, all you have to do is hit run. So as I mentioned, my goal here is to pull more information earlier into the design process so that we can make more informed decisions. I'm doing that through time savings. For me, that starts at site selection. So say your developer comes to you and they have 10 solar sites and they need you to tell them which one they should continue developing. Do you have time to run through all 10 sites or are you gonna pick the three that look the most promising? You've automated this process. You can do multiple iterations on those 10 sites. So you can go back to your developer and you can say, you know, site A, yes, it has the best resource, but you're kind of land constrained. You're gonna have to reduce your pitch. Losses are gonna go up. Site B might be a better option and that's valuable information to know when you're back at the site selection step. From there, it's really easy to combine all of your results into a compelling argument for financial approval for the, that selected project, but you can continue developing. But as we all know, that's really only the beginning. From here, we run into a cycle of optimization, sensitivity analysis, risk analysis, and this is all just more iterations of that production assessment, which can really take a lot of time so how are we currently making these decisions, running these processes? Kind of have two options. You can run a resource comparison, which is fast. You don't need to make assumptions on your technology. There are open source options available, NSRDB data sets. There are tools that exist like Solar Resource Compass. At the end of the day, this resource comparison is a proxy for production. It tends to be a pretty good proxy, but it's still a proxy. So then our other option is that production comparison. This is a higher fidelity analysis, but you do have to make those technology assumptions. It's also more time intensive, and that can limit you 
in the number of iterations, number of different options you can explore. And that's where automation comes in. So when I first talked to my boss and he said, I want to start automating these processes, she had two main points. One is that's a pretty big project and I didn't have a lot of support. And the other is that I'm not personally a computer programmer. If either of those resonate with you, I have the same advice. Take a deep breath and just start really small. Um, it's also really helpful to have a network of people who are experienced in your coding language, especially if you're newer to it. This can be another team member, someone in IT, it can just be a family member. They don't need to be in the solar industry. I talk to other people who have no experience in solar all the time about Python because I need help with the language. I don't need help with the solar modeling part. So we've got our network, we're starting small. And by that, I mean, just figure out how to load your data sources into the program. If you're thinking, I need to start even smaller than that, totally fine. I recommend you take a class in your preferred coding language. And by that, I mean, try to take the full class. It can be really tempting to cherry pick sessions, ignore ones you don't think are relevant. But a lot of those maybe side sections can be really helpful in understanding how your language works and comes together which will be really helpful as we start stringing together our tools so we can get a fully automated process. Code Academy has great courses if you're trying to learn Python. Python 2 and 3 are the current flavors of Python. I'm seeing fewer and fewer use cases of Python 2. So if you're just getting started, I recommend Code Academy's Python 3 course. I don't get paid by Code Academy. Um, now, take our class. We got some basics. We're back to loading in that data. I use Pandas. I think a lot of people here also use pandas. It's a really great package within Python, allows you to easily load your data, especially time series data, and manipulate it in many of the ways we as an industry tend to manipulate our data. If you are new to coding, my biggest piece of advice is to always use functions. If you ever find yourself going to copy and paste lines of code, you should be asking yourself if you can pull that out into its own function and just reference that, because eventually you will want to change your code. And it will be so much easier on you if you can do that in one place and try to find every single place you have copy pasted those lines. I promise. So our data is now in Python. We're starting, ready to start making some tools. And I started with a simple resource comparison tool. This involves a lot of visualization. Uh, so I needed a way to plot my data. For that, I used matplotlib. It's another Python package. There are other packages for great plotting, making things pretty, but this has a lot of great basic functionality. There's a lot of resources on programs like Stack Exchange. I went through this and mimicked the process that Alvin Group currently uses. Kept testing, kept using those functions, using those best practices until I was able to exactly replicate what I would do manually. And then once this was in place, I was ready to just start building tools for different loss factors. It started with a soiling loss tool. Then it turned out we needed a string sizing tool that was a little bit more robust. From there, we wanted to look at effective degradation. Um, so I was able to build all of these tools. And the great part about these is that they're super valuable as standalone tools. I don't need a fully automated process to make really great use of a soiling loss tool. I can just plug that into my modeling software right away. So it's really nice to be able to see that value when you're, you know, earlier in the process. You don't have to wait until you're at the very end. So now we have a couple tools in place. We have a few options. We can improve those tools. We can add in functionality. If we took a shortcut in our methodology. We can take that shortcut out, go the long way around. We can also look into pulling our inputs automatically. But our other option is to start connecting those tools. So for example, we know that production is an input to our string sizing. We know that string sizing our resource is an input to the production. But you run into a problem. And that is that solar production modeling is complicated. And this is where APIs come in or PVLib, you know. So if you hit a process that is complex, that is time consuming, that is proprietary, that you would normally use third party software to complete, you should look and see if that third party offers an API because that way you don't have to change your methodology. You can still use those tools. You just use them through Python. So this is what my process currently looks like. I pull my data sources. These are in orange because I'm using an API to call all of them. 
Most of the data sources, the satellite sources, the industry is currently using already have API access from open source ones like NSRDB to the pay for play ones, Solar GIS, Solar Anywhere by Solo. So I download these and I run them through that resource comparison tool and I output my chosen data source and any corrections I want to apply. Now I'm ready to start looking at production, but that involves those loss factors. So I pull some precipitation data. It's an orange again because I'm going to make another API call. Both NOAA and PRISM are API accessible. You can download those programmatically. I run that through my soiling loss tool, and now I'm starting to think about string sizing. But I need production for that. So I pull an API, run that through my production modeling, and I'm able to get to my string sizing pool inputs. Now we have some key information here. We've got a resource. We have some basic design information. We're ready to rerun our production modeling, and this is where we hit that optimization process. So this is going to be pretty iterative, and this is where our time saving is. We're going over and over in different designs. You might even have to go further back in the process, rerun that string sizing tool if you're looking at different technology, things like that. But eventually, you start to coalesce on a design. You're ready to send that through your effective degradation tool. But at this point, I was thinking, well, Avangrid has its own methodology it needs to apply in post-processing, its own secret sauce. So I extended that into a post-processing tool, just made it a little bit larger. Now, this is the most important part. Automation is wonderful, but it is not a replacement for your eyes on the data. I think Adam Jensen mentioned something similar in his presentation. Uh, for this information, or for this purpose, whenever I'm creating these tools, there is always formatted output. It includes tables, it includes figures, it includes all my intermediate steps as well as my final answers. And this information is great because I can really easily open that document and say, data source two has a time shift in it. I need to fix that. Or this production modeling numbers don't make any sense. I need to make sure my inputs to my API are set correctly. All of this data value, all of this data visualization um, is super helpful in identifying any issues that may come up. So we always want to be doing that. Now, where do I stand on my goal? I wanted to save time and I wanted to do that so that I could pull more information earlier into my design process. Using Avangrid's methodology, a solar resource assessment will take me about three hours. Loss calculations might be another hour or two. The optimization process might be another hour or two. I'm gonna go through every single part of my model, make sure it's just in place, ready for financial investment decisions. Might be another hour, just double checking. When I've automated this process, hours and days turned into minutes and seconds. So when we were back at that site selection store or step, we were able to transition from a resource comparison all the way to a detailed production comparison. So if you are like me and you are a solar developer, what I want you to take away from this is that you do not need to be a computer scientist in order to start automating your processes and that there is also a lot of value in that automation, which comes from your time savings, which is not gonna automate you out of a job. It's just allowing you to run more iterations to get more information so that you can make better decisions. That being said, blind automation will lead to bad data. Always, always visualize your data, make sure it's aligning with your expectations. But now that we're here, there are so many useful applications that are just in reach. Uh, I extended our automated production assessment into a total pipeline analysis, which has been super helpful. We're also currently looking at combining this research with uh, financial modeling so that when we're back at that site selection step and we said, okay, maybe site B is the one to go with, we can now say, well, site B might have the best NCF, but site C has the lowest LCOE. That's really great information to know so early in your design process. You can also use this on methodology studies and modeling research, allowing you to really make your validation studies more robust as you're running them through your entire pipeline instead of a select few projects you have time to run them through. If you are instead on the software or the data or the tool provider side, I want to give you a huge thank you because most of you are already providing API access to the products you sell, and that has certainly made my job a lot easier. That I want to say thank you to a couple of my coworkers, Emily Greeno and Peter Hall. Uh, Peter Hall has told me to say hi to all of you who know him. He's typically told me that. Um, but I also want to give a special shout out to Allison Mueller, who's in the back over there. She had a great poster on a simplified approach to sub-hourly clipping. Uh, go say hi. She's super smart and awesome. 
so thank you.